All right, guys, welcome to a brand new episode of SideQuest Podcast. Listen in and level up. I have a great episode for you today, but first, as always, let's get through the show notes. If you're not following the Facebook page, head over to Facebook, type SideQuest Fitness into the search bar and like the page. There, you're going to get updates on podcast episodes, articles when they get posted, and you're going to get a brand new taco recipe every Tuesday for Taco Camp. Uh, Plus lots of other shenanigans and nerd talk throughout the week. So make sure you head over to Facebook. You can follow me on Instagram. My handle is SideQuestFM. If you want to see some cool videos and random stuff on Instagram as well, you can follow me on Instagram. Same handle, SideQuestFM. Or follow me on Snapchat, SideQuestFit. Follow me there. Send me your questions. Uh, I want to get all the questions from you, help you as much as I can on your fitness journey or your journey in life, whatever it may be. But head over to Snapchat, SideQuest Fit, follow me there. You get a little more personal, in-depth look at the shenanigans I get into throughout uh, every day. Uh, But I do love getting questions from the community, so please send them out to me. If you have not left a review for the podcast, please head over to iTunes. If you're not listening on iTunes and you listen on SoundCloud or Stitcher, leave a review there as well. When you leave reviews, it helps me move up the charts on the iTunes store so that more people can see and hear the amazing guests that I've had on and have on each and every single week. So make sure you head over there. And don't forget, if you haven't picked up your copy of The 7 Principles of Fat Loss, head over to sidequestfitness.com forward slash 7 principles and you can pick up your copy of The 7 Principles of Fat Loss. These are the same 7 principles I follow each and every day and teach my clients to help them shred away more body fat, unlock heroic strength, and just look better naked. So if you want to unlock strength or just look better naked in the mirror, head over again, grab those seven principles of fat loss, and start following those today. All right, guys, I have a great episode for you. Jason Helmus of Any Man Fitness is returning for his third episode ever, almost a year to the date as I had him on uh, last year. But he has a great product he's putting out today. As you've probably noticed, the podcast is coming out a little later and not on Monday. So I'm putting it out today to help Jason out with no squats, no deadlifts, huge gains. The brand new program he is putting out that you can grab when you head over to SideQuest Fitness forward slash Jason Helmus 3. That's J-A-S-O-N-H-E-L-M-E-S. Three. Put a hyphen in between Jason and between Helmus and in between three. And you can pick up and get a link over to no squats, no deadlifts, huge gains. Uh, Jason is a great friend of mine, a huge inspiration to me as an online coach uh, and in the fitness industry. Uh, I love this dude so much. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We talk about his new program that he's putting out to help people who want to gain mass, build muscle, but not using squats and deadlifts. He's getting older. He can't really do a lot of that anymore. Um, And we talk about the importance of of what that can do, adding volume to really build that strong, sexy physique and looking like really great naked, how awesome that can feel. Um, But his program, how it can help you get there without squatting and without deadlifting. Sounds a little crazy, I know, but it is the truth. You can do it. Bodybuilder Dorian Yates never squatted, only used the leg press, and he had fucking tree trunks for legs. But I'm going to shut up. Let's get into the show. Let's hear from Jason. We're going to catch up. It's a good time. Uh, so check out this episode. Jason Helmus. No squats. No deadlifts. Huge gains. Step up and you got to get it fitness. Host Rob at the moment and the quest is you got to check it and wreck it. You're breaking personal records. And with the help of the guests, you won't be guessing on the lessons. That's a plus five fierce. Got a low key bamf right here. You want to meet him, there's no better way to greet him than to strike a boss pose, take a look into the mirror. All right, guys, welcome to a brand new episode. I'm stoked again, about a year to the date. We are speaking uh, on Skype again, but I, I'm uh, stoked to have Jason Helmus back on uh, the podcast. He's got a great product that he's putting out, uh, which is interesting because it's a muscle building product that involves no squats and no deadlifts, which... I know it's possible. You can totally do it. I have friends who've done it. I've seen Jason do it. Um, I don't know, man. I love me some squats and deadlifts. Uh, uh, but uh, but I want to find out why uh, this is important and, and for who this will work. But uh, Jason, welcome back to the show, man. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is this is third times the charm, right? Like this this oh, yeah. is this is well, you, this is number three. 
you've got some practice now under your belt. You've been running your own uh, little podcast as well, so. I do. I've been trying to. I, I still make a lot of rookie mistakes, and I'm working on my voice and making sure not. You really have to be careful with things. As a teacher, you sometimes use your voice kind of as a, a teaching tool, and you go louder and then quieter and higher and then lower. And that you can't really do that on a podcast as much because then your listener is going to be turning up the volume and down the volume and taking the headphones off their ears. So I'm still learning some things that are a bit out of my element, but thank you very much. Appreciate that. See, I didn't know you could do that. I just, I just do whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm literally like, I'm going to sound like the most natural person in the room. I'm not going to be like, uh, you know, uh, NPR radio host. But, uh, <laughs> is, but, but when you say find your voice, you still have to find your own voice within a podcast as well. Uh, I think that's even for writing, for doing anything. You got to find your own groove. So it takes a little while. Um, totally. Really? Wasn't it wasn't it Miles Davis that said you have to play for years before you uh, learn what you sound like or it was something like that? Thing. Yeah, one of one of those guys, um, <laughs> which is, you know, it's 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 pretty true. Um, but uh, how, how you been, man? How's uh, how's things? I've been good. I've been good. Been real good. Um, the summer's been really productive. Um, I am. Uh, if for your listeners that don't know, I do teach middle school and have for twelve years. So, summertime is my time to step a little bit back from that job and and jump into the waters full time on the online job, uh, online fitness business. So, and we do have our first product coming out as you mentioned there. So there's all kinds of behind the scenes, back end techie kind of things that we've been struggling and wrestling with over the last couple of months. And uh, we're just getting our ducks in a row, making sure we're ready to rock. That It comes out on September 20th, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be discussing that here in a little bit. But things are good. Things are good. The kids are growing up. Uh, Brooklyn's my oldest daughter. She's six which is crazy to think she's going into first grade and Ava's uh, getting in her last year of preschool. And it will be so awesome when that bill is off the books. <laughs> let me tell you, holy crap. My dad is a very wise man. And he told me when I was a teenager, if you want to be rich, don't ever have children. <laughs> and he was right. So, uh, but anyways, things are good. Sorry. I'm starting to ramble here a little bit. No, things no. are good, Robbie. No, you're 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 fine. Uh, I like that. I like that wisdom. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not I'm not going there. Uh, maybe someday <laughs> I'll get the balls up to write about why children terrify me. But I don't I don't know. Hey, uh, children terrify me, and I'm an actual father, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the program is called No Squats, No Deadlifts, Big Gains, Huge Gains, Huge Gains, Huge, yes, huge gains. gains, Huge Gains. Um, I, I I like the title. It's it's uh it's kind of like all right. So I'm not gonna do the lifts that the internet and everyone tells me that I can do and still make huge gains. Um, and I've had a little sneak peek look at it, and dude, it looks it's sexy. It's it looks good. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank just, you, thank it's you. It's not slapped together and you putting up an Instagram photo of being like ten dollars. Get this thing. Get this thing. Um, it looks good. The programming is is really smart. Um, but why no squats and no deadlifts? Well, let me kind of fill you in a little bit on how this entire product came to be. Um, when I very first started in, in this space about three and a half years ago, I obviously chose the name Any Man Fitness and for my business. And the reason was clear because I was just a regular guy. And that's not even a, a marketing thing or a branding thing or some sort of a weird angle I was playing. I was a middle school teacher that just got curious. And I got curious because my health wasn't very good and I weighed too much and I didn't look like a man. I wasn't confident in my abilities to do much outside of, you know, teach and eat wings and drink beer, which is fun. But um, <laughs> so I was just totally normal. And that's why I came up with that idea, Any Man Fitness, because I just started reading and just started learning. And I stayed curious and I tried new things and I self-experimented with all sorts of different protocols. I've done pretty much every protocol known to man um, when it comes to calorie restriction, huge fasts, uh, you know, no food fast for full entire days up to 36 hours, zero carbs, tons of carbs, no fat. I mean, I've done all of it. And, um, 
that that's kind of why I started my blog is to just show people my experiences and through my own self experimentation and helping out friends and eventually taking on clients, I, I learned what works. And I also learned that oftentimes there's some sort of a disconnect between what works and what quote unquote everyone knows. And I've always just questioned those things. There was a time where I was a low carb zealot and I thought Anytime you ate insulin, fat instantly got packed on your body. Like I would argue that to the death about insulin being a storage hormone. And I can't believe you're eating that banana there. You're going to get fat. Your blood sugar is messed up. That's what I firmly believed at one point in my life until I started, again, self-experimenting, reading more and learning more. So anyways, um, I got into fitness and I started with the big three when I really got into it, right? When I got away from the, the curls and, 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 you know, every day is chest day kind of a situation, which is kind <laughs> of funny because the product, I think there's like four chest days, but anyways, just joking. Um, but not really. Uh, and so I followed the, what everyone tells you to do, right? Follow a basic linear progression, do some sort of a starting strength, some sort of a, a, a strong lifts five by five, maybe a five, three, one, it progressed into a reverse pyramid training an RPT kind of a thing. And I got really strong doing that really strong, uh, to the point, I mean, my numbers weren't powerlifting elite or anything, but I was deadlifting 500. I was, uh, bench pressing over 300. I was squatting in the 300s. You might go, Oh, fitness guy with a 300 squat. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm six foot eight jerk face. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> to get all the way down there and back up. So I had, I had what I would call, I would label them, um, well above average commercial gym numbers is what I would call them, really. Um, and, and, and that's through a lot of different bulking and cutting cycles, bulking and cutting and bulking and cutting and bulking and cutting. And at the end of one of those bulks is when I hit those numbers. And, and I remember looking at myself in the mirror going, all right, well, let's strip this fat away. And I'd strip the fat away and i go, I mean, I'm stronger and I know I've gained some muscle, but I'm like, where is this? You hear these internet articles about you know, squat and deadlift and need above maintenance and you're going to gain 15 or 20 pounds of muscle and you're going to this and you're going to that and you're going to – and that just wasn't happening for me. And I started to add a little bit more volume to my own routines. And as I added a little bit more volume to my own routines, I noticed some nice size gains. I said, okay, well, that's obvious because muscle growth is dose dependent. And that just kind of kept the curiosity juices flowing in my head. And – I started to ask myself, I started to wonder, are these squats and deadlifts causing muscle or are all these bicep curls or doing, you know, maxing out my volume in, in seated cable rows, is that causing more muscle growth? Are doing these squats causing muscle growth or should I go do some hip thrusts? What if I just do leg extensions? Is that better for a guy my size? So these are all questions that aren't really answerable. Like how can you quantify that? It's not like you can actually Google search that and have an answer. You need to have some sort of empirical anecdotal evidence. So I, I did a number. I looked. I did a number of things, but one of the biggest things I turned turned to is I turned to Brad Schoenfeld, and I looked up some of his works on muscular hypertrophy and how to get bigger. His website is called Look Great Naked, and that was my main goal. I wanted to look great naked. I wanted to look great and feel great. I didn't really care if my numbers were big because I realized the only people that give a shit about your big powerlifting numbers, unless you're a powerlifter. The only people that give a shit about those numbers don't exist in the real world. Like, they, they exist on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Like, I told you I'm a normal dude, and I'd go to my job, and I'd walk around, and I'm teaching sixth graders math, and I'm interacting in the teacher's lounge, and I'm like, how come nobody asked me about my deadlift? <laughs> like, because nobody cares. You know, nobody cares and that's we get so caught up in this facebook world and i make a post about yeah i don't squat and deadlift anymore and all of a sudden there's 50 comments and i'm called all kinds of names and people are going oh here's some little newbie who thinks he knows what he's talking about uh, and like everyone gets all pissed off at me and i'm like guys the only people that care are you 50 people that commented on facebook you're it nobody else cares like this is totally an echo chamber so anyways, uh, back to Brad Schoenfeld. He had an amazing review paper in 2010. You can see how I fill up my time uh, dude, teaching with words. I, I, but I'm with, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think yep. that's one of the things that, that, I, that I struggle with at times as a coach 
online or even in person is I'm like, Ooh, I, you know, you want to, I know this knowledge. I want to sound cool. They don't care. Mm-hmm. They, like they, like they don't care. Really, they just want to know what to do. They don't care. People want to know how to get the results that they want. They, they don't need to know the 5,000 different muscles or that this and does that. And this, like, it's great that we know that and we can, we can geek out on the, it. Look, it's like star Wars, Look, I can talk about like extended universe stuff all day. I can talk about video games. Nine times out of ten, people are like, look, I know there's Luke, Han, and Leia, and Chewie. Uh, mm-hmm. That's it. I don't, yep. I don't care. Very true. Very true. So anyways, um, I, I, Brad Schoenfeld had a groundbreaking paper. It's a little bit older, uh, 2010, but it, it was groundbreaking then, and it's still referenced in many articles, and you may have heard of it yourself. Um, the mechanisms for muscular hypertrophy and their application to resistance training is what the paper was called. Big, long title. Uh, base, Come base on, Brad, paper. simplify that. <laughs> I know. Okay, I'll give you the TLDR. Here's the shit that makes your muscles bigger, and here's how to apply it. Okay? I so like that, that copy better. <laughs> there you go. There's there's the Cliff's notes, but Brad's a smart. He's a PhD and a college professor and all that nonsense. Um, but anyways... Um, and he spotted in his paper, so I'm reading this paper, right? And he picked out the three mechanisms, three factors to make your muscles bigger. And those factors are, first off, mechanical tension. When you are putting your muscle under a load and there is tension in that muscle, whether you're talking about your bicep in a bicep cur- curl, your lats in a pull-up, your quads in a leg press, keeping tension in that muscle right? Um, The second factor to muscular growth is metabolic stress. And metabolic stress is often referred to as the pump in bodybuilding circles, right? You know, Arnold, ah, the pump, you feel, you feel the pump. It's better than coming, right? Uh, If you've ever (laughs) seen pumping iron before, if not, you need to go watch it. Uh, But the pump is what's caused by contracting a muscle continuously over time and causing a lactic acid buildup in the muscle. And when the muscle enlarges and it gets swelled up with that lactic acid the blood can't run through the veins and that's what causes that feeling of holy shit my arm is going to cut open and tendons and and, and ligaments are going to spill all over the gym floor so you got to chase the pump and the last thing is muscular damage you have to push your muscles to do something that they have never done before this is the main component of progressive overload right the right. five more pounds one more rep to a little more volume you have to, you you can't stay the same or else you're not going to force an adaptation on your muscles and if you get adequate muscular damage you're going to cause little rips and little tears in your muscles and then after they repair themselves over time they'll become stronger and they will also become bigger due to what amounts to scar tissue in your muscles so i was looking at those three factors and i looked at them really closely and i started to think about it do i maximize mechanical tension with my lifts do i do that and so i would spend time in the actual gym thinking about and this was the first time i was ever really thinking about the movement that i was performing when i was in the gym when i was doing a pull up i was thinking what muscles are you recruiting when you're doing this are you using your traps your lats your biceps what are you contracting what should you be contracting if the desired effect is muscular growth and hypertrophy and i was i started to do that on every single lift and i realized no i was not maximizing my mechanical tension and this is one of the three major components to muscular growth so i thought i mean how many gains am i losing on the table by lifting in this sort of a build strength at all expenses kind of a thought process going for bigger and bigger numbers so that was the first thing that kind of got me thinking there and maximizing your muscular contractions with tension is a lot easier said than done. And we've had a number of beta testers on the program and they've kind of come back. Okay. How do I do this? Cause I, I have a couple of chapters that are in the book, a couple of, of excerpts about how properly to do this. And it's still, it's not an easy thing. It requires a lot of practice to do, but I noticed a few things. First off, if you bounce your chest in a chest press, that is a release of mechanical tension. Mm-hmm. If if you rest it on your chest for a split second, that's a release of mechanical tension. If you lock out your legs in a squat or in, in, in a uh, like a leg press, that's a release of mechanical tension. If you fully extend your arm all the way down and even wait just a tenth of a second on a bicep curl, that's a, all these things are releases of mechanical tension. And this really got me thinking, holy shit, I do that all the time. 
right? Like in a pull-up. And when I got to the top of the pull-up, I would just, it'd just be a split second, but on the way back down, I kind of released the mechanical tension and sort of free fall for just a second before I came back up. And we need to maximize that. The second thing was the actual pump. Um, the the metabolic uh, metabolic stress and I started to ask myself like how often do you feel the pump and I realized that like not that often did I really get a real skin splitting sick veiny pump that just that wasn't happening with the kinds of workouts I was doing and I wasn't using low volume I was probably using between excuse me between twenty uh, twenty five sets per session but. Some of the sets didn't really elicit a pump. I never really felt like I got a sick pump from squats or or from deadlifts. Perhaps that's something that I was doing wrong in them. That's possible. I'm not saying that it's not. But I kept thinking, you know, if, if you want your muscles to be bigger, we need to get this metabolic stress to be maximized, and I definitely wasn't doing that. Um, and the last of those components was muscular damage, doing something I'd never done before, and I was doing that. That was the one of the th- one of the three factors that I was definitely doing, because for many many years I played beat the training log, and because I played beat the training log, and I consistently more often than not, probably 75, 80 percent of the time, I did beat the training log. I was overall making gains in my training, so that was the one that I had already accomplished. But when I looked at the other two, when I looked at mechanical tension. And I looked at metabolic stress and how to maximize them. I became curious on how effective squats and deadlifts would be in order to maximize those two components in my own training. I was wondering how I could get achieve the pump adequately with deadlifts and squats and if it would be better suited with other movements, if I could work the muscles individually instead of working them as a whole, as those movements tend to do, if I would get better results, pump the muscle up better, if I'd be able to keep better tension on the muscle. And I didn't know the answers to those questions. Um, so I decided to do what I always did back, like I, like I mentioned back in 2013 when I first got curious I made up a plan and went with it, and I tried to maximize those three components. And in the three and a half, I think there was a, a total of about 13 or 14 weeks that I utilized this program, uh, programming on myself. I've never made so many gains in my entire life. Uh, it was it, – it was, and I know – there's. Let, let, me, let me play devil's advocate here. There's this part of me that says, dude, the only reason you made all those gains is because you got strong as fuck before you started it. Like that argument is there and I, yeah, but I just think there's this real point of diminishing returns. Like, okay, before I started training like that, I was still deadlifting before, I'm sorry, before I I, I went on a bulking path to deadlifting 500, I was still deadlifting 440. Would this program have done anything differently if I would have started it then? What if I was only deadlifting 400? Like what sort of a strength level, a base strength level do you need in order for this to be a beneficial thing? Because I think that that's a, a misconception. That's where people end up getting a little butt hurt on the yeah. internet, if you will, is that they think that what I've created is a pussy's way out. And I'm sorry for using that language if anybody's offended by that word. But it's like people tend to go, oh, man, it's a program for people that don't squat and don't deadlift. What kind of weak ass shit is this? And like they get like all mad. Like I'm, I'm trying to go against everything that, that, that the fitness world has ever known. And I'm here to tell you it's a five-day, 75, 80-minute per workout bodybuilding high-volume split. If you are weak or you think this is the easy way out – I dare you to try to last a month. It's not going to happen. Like, it's grueling. I'm a highly trained person. And by about week seven, I was like, holy shit, am I going to make it to the end of this? And eventually, your, your body does adapt and you get better at that high volume training. So it does get better as time goes on. But this is not the easy way out. It's, it's not. I want to be very clear from that. If you are an untrained individual and you go, oh, sweet, dude, I'm going to pick this up and I want to squat and deadlift and I'm going to get huge gains. You're not going to last. You're, you're not going to be able to complete the program. You do need a base of strength before you start. So after I just went on a monologue for 25 <laughs> minutes, um, what's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you said a lot of really, really interesting things in that. Now you, you've kind of been the fat loss man 
like no cardio, fat shredding. That's that's been your jam for for a long time. So, is this something that uh, is this a fat loss program, or is it specifically set up for you've lost the fat, you've gotten you know down and lean? Now we're going to build. Is this the second step after this? Is, this is this is specifically a building program, and there is a nutritional component that's in there. It, it's very straightforward because there's no reason to get fancy when you're talking about uh, you know either at the least body recomposition and at the most a straight up bulk. Um, and in the nutritional component, I make sure that I'm very clear with everybody. You do not want to attempt this at a deficit because it's so much volume. You're not going to be able to recover from that kind of volume if you're rocking a thousand calorie a day deficit or something. I mean, you'll you'll be dead. You're not going to make it through. So this is a pointed gaining situation. You'll notice the timing. It came out on September 20th, just in time for fall bulking season, right? Where uh, the summer is over and it's time to eat ourselves stupid. You lucky people who get to go through that this fall. You lucky people. Oh, I'm so jacked up. I get the bulk, uh, uh, and I mean, maintained my leanness until now. But no, I would not recommend trying something like this unless you are at least under 15%. Ultimately, in, in a perfect world, you'd probably be under 12, and you'd have some room to uh, put on a little bit of fat without getting yourself out of the healthy range. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it in, as a fat loss protocol. Um, I have primarily focused on fat loss, but one thing that I've always kind of done really is. Whatever I'm currently doing, whatever I'm currently trying, I end up writing about it and getting passionate about it and, and coaching others through that. Um, so I always, I always do some self-experimentation on myself, and then I give the self-experimentation to a few, few clients who are interested. Hey, man, I got this new protocol. I tried it out on myself. I loved it. What do you think? Yeah, okay, I'll give it a shot. Some people are willing to do that. And sometimes they, they love it, and they go, hell, yeah, this is awesome, and it becomes a book. And other times they go, that was fucking stupid, dude. And I'm like, all right, well, We'll scrap that one. <laughs> like I mean, you just you never know what's going to happen, right? I mean, that's, thus that's, is, thus is growth. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I have a, I save all my programs that I put clients through, and you know, might go back to to doing them. Uh, I'll mention something to you after this. I should have mentioned it beforehand. We chatted for like twenty minutes before this, and I didn't mention something that I'm I'm going to experiment with, uh, for a possible product. Uh, I'll tell you about it later. Um, now I'm curious. Okay, go we'll, for it. We'll talk about it later. Um, <laughs> okay. No, no, because I, I think that's one thing that a lot – that one of the biggest things I've learned is if you really – like so many people look at the magazine and they're like, I'm going to get jacked. I want to look muscular like that, dude. But if you're holding on an extra 30 or 40 pounds, the best way for you to get to that point is to lose as much fat as possible because it is going to help your body – you know, one, recomp itself and shuttle all of that stuff actually over to, you know, building more muscle because you're going to have that strength base. Like you said, you're going to get in, you're going to make those newbie gains and go from 20 pounds on a goblet squat to 50 pounds on a goblet squat in like maybe eight weeks. Maybe, mo- may- maybe you're really a freaking nature. Like one of my clients who's like, um, I don't have enough weight to do goblet squats anymore. So I'm like, um, pause goblet squats. One and a half <laughs> goblet squats. Dude, we're going to get you over always the something you do. <laughs> Yeah, always something. Um, but I, I think that's something that you know a lot of people – is a myth out there. You just think you can jump in and start bulking immediately. Um, so I'm glad to see that you've kind of done a fat loss thing. Uh, that's sort of been your thing, and now you're getting into to the muscle gain. How have – so you talked about Brad Schoenfeld, and for those who don't know Brad, please go check out uh, anything that Brad has mentioned. I'll have it in the show notes – uh, as well. I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, uh, URL will be for this one, but just head over to Cyclops. Yeah, uh, just... It's, it's uh, actually, he has a published on his website. His website is lookgreatnaked.com. Okay. Um, so and look... he has a PDF of it published on his website. If you just Google it, um, I'll, I'll shoot you a link afterwards. You can put in your show notes. Yeah. I have in the show notes, cyclopsfitness.com. Uh, and just go over to podcast and grab the show notes there. I'll have a link for that, but Brad's written a ton of books and he's kind of like the muscle master. The, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of muscle building, if you will. Um, how how did your programming sort of change once you started to get more into to Brad's stuff? Because I've seen you change. Since I've known you, I've seen you go from really very much a, a reverse pyramid, Martin Birkin sort of guy to, you know, now you're, you're adding more volume as, as you get, as you get older. <laughs> the guns are huge. Uh, how, how, how has that changed for you? 
You know, I, this is just, this is me personally, and this is this is self reflection, and, and and what I want to do because this is you know by no means am, am I not squatting or um, am I not programming squats and deadlifts with my clients? I do. I program them with most of my clients, um, really, unless they specifically have an injury or we need a workaround or they don't have the equipment. Um, and and looking at Brad's different components, I really started asking myself the deep questions, I guess. Um, and, and when I first started lifting, it was every, every single article you looked at, how do you build size, strength, improve your life, masculinity, the, your psychological edge, the ability to look fear in, in, right in its face and conquer that fear. <laughs> Everything has to do with Squatting and deadlifting. I mean, that, that's every single article that you see. Shit, I've written articles that literally say that exact same thing. So I get that. And But I had gotten to the point where I felt like I was no longer trying to conquer some psychological fear of can I do it or can I not do it. I was just acting irresponsibly. Um, and... I don't know exactly when when I realized that I was at that line. Maybe when I got my numbers up to, to pretty decent numbers and the sheer thought of trying to turn a 500 deadlift into a 600 deadlift over the next five years was enough to make me say, I don't know if I want to do this. And it's it, it just it, I really started to think about what are, my, what are my purposes. And I really did start to think about who in the real world, when I'm talking about my wife and my girls – And my mom and dad and in-laws and friends, when we're who genuinely cares about my lifting numbers? And the answer was nobody. I mean, really, the answer was nobody. Um, And I wasn't going to be a power lifter. And and so that's what what got me thinking about this. And and I started to ask myself, what are my goals. What do I want to do with fitness? And I wanted to build more muscle. I mean, really that all falls into, like, I want to look good. I wanted to look good. Um, and I didn't feel like I had enough muscle on my frame to look good. I felt lean, which gave me a lot of confidence and it made me feel great. And I wasn't scared to take off my shirt or ashamed anymore, which is a huge difference between just a few short years ago. So that was definitely a positive thing, but I didn't feel that look at my shoulders, look at my chest, like that sort of a, I didn't feel that masculinity. I didn't feel that, that manliness. I wanted a kind of a, maybe the superhero physique, I guess you could say. Um, and then of course I wanted to feel good. I wanted to feel energized. I didn't want to be the kind of guy who, who plays some basketball with his kid and then needs to sit down because he's sweating. Um, I didn't want to be the guy who has difficulty tying my shoes because of my big old gut. I've been that guy before. It's no fun to be that guy. Trust me. Um, so those were my goals. And so I wanted to make sure that my training aligned with my goals. And I went from being a religious you need your rest three times per week. Don't overtrain four rest days per week. For years, I did that. So I was just said, screw it. I'm going all in because I'm going to eliminate squats and deadlifts. For a guy my size, those two things completely exhausted me. Deadlifts, all I wanted to do was take a nap for like the next 24 hours. Like my entire central nervous system. It, seriously, I would jokingly tell people I, I got run over by the, the, the deadlift train today. Like that's what I felt like. I just got annihilated and destroyed. Squats didn't make me that fatigued to the core the way that deadlifts did, but they made my legs, my hamstrings, glutes, hips, lower back so sore that for the next 48 hours, all I want to do is lay on the couch. Like I didn't, I'd have trouble going up and down stairs, all those memes like, you know, this is for leg day and it shows like the granny with the thing that goes up and down the stairs. I'm sure you've seen those memes before that, uh, like that was like my real life. And, I'm sitting here and my daughter will go, hey, daddy, come down on the floor and play dolls with me. And I'd be like, that floor right there? Uh Huh? (laughs) You know, like, I don't know if I want to, it's going to be painful. So I'd go get down, oh, oh, oh. And she'd be like, daddy, what's wrong? And I'd be like, oh, yesterday was leg day, (laughs) you know? And I, I kept thinking, like, what am I doing this for? Like, what am I making myself this miserable 
before. Um, and, and could I have taken another approach and changed my programming and gone through lots of flexibility things and, and foam rolled and mobility drill? Yeah, sure. There's another approach to it. But I thought to myself, well, if my goal is just pure sexiness and to get the pure sexiness, I need to maximize those three components that I had talked about earlier. I asked myself if I really needed those. And the answer was no. So I came up with a plan and the most amazing thing happened. I was sore as shit for like two weeks because my volume just shot through the roof and I was training 80 hours a day or 80 hours a day, 80 minutes a day. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of training. 80 minutes a day for five days a week. So at first I was super sore. After about 10 to 14 days passed, soreness was gone, just gone. And I could push myself to failure set after set after set after set after set. And I could push the weights and I was increasing linearly. And really what was happening is I was providing a totally new stimulus and a totally new chance for my body to adapt. Um, I started eating breakfast and that was a big thing. I went from a fasting guy to a breakfast guy and got an extra protein bolus in there too. Um, that's part of the nutritional plan that's in the program too. We don't recommend this to fasters. If you're a faster, drop the fasting before you jump on board. Um, and so, I mean, there were a few different changes. So was it just the working out? No, it wasn't just the working out. It was probably the totality of the entire program that I put together. But Robbie, I don't know if I'll ever go back, man. Like, And I'm still training in this capacity. Um, when I'm cutting, I'll go from five days, maybe down to three or four days, but I'll still train kind of in, in the same sorts of, of manner. Um, and then next week when my bulk starts, yes, for, for the love of the fitness gods, my bulk starts Monday. Um, I'm training it, it, not the exact program. I've tweaked it and revamped it. And, uh, I, I'm, you know, no squats, no deadlifts, huge gains 2.0, I guess you could say, but I'm going to go another round and, and try some different strategies and different muscle building techniques and see how these go for me. So um, I do think I'll hit a point in my life where I go, okay, I need to just work on strength for a couple months and I need to regroove the deadlift tract and the barbell back uh, squat tracked and maybe even the barbell bench press tracked. I might give that one up forever though. I did. Yeah, that's the, the one I'm, like, yeah, what well, barbell bench press or whatever. Um, but I, I, so I probably will at some point go back to that strength phase. Okay. Let's get those numbers up. But you know, I feel better. I'm less sore. I have more energy. I look way sexier. Um, and I, I just have a higher quality of life. So I, I'm really loving it. Dude. Uh, I know there is no qualms about looking sexier. Um, I, uh, that's actually on my list of podcasts to do by the time this up is up. <laughs> Maybe there's a solo episode on why, uh, it irks me that people are like, Oh, but you're so vain. Yeah, you damn right. I'm vain. It's me. I want to look good. I want to look good. Like I want to be sexy. I grew up screech. Let me look like <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah, I, I grew up six foot eight, two hundred five pounds of wet noodle. So, <laughs> so when I, I I get a look from time to time uh, out in public from uh, various people, um, you can't pretend like that's not a nice confidence and ego boost to go. Yep, I just saw that person checking me out. I mean, of course it is. Whether you're a man or a woman, it's a primal instinct to look and feel attractive and we need to embrace yeah. that primality. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I've had a few uh, college students find out my wife is, I'm the husband, the guy they've seen at the gym, uh, that my wife is the professor and they're like, oh, oh, well, she's lucky. And I'm like, yeah, I like that look in your face. I like that look in your <laughs> Yeah. This podcast could go in a totally different direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, so no, I actually want to ask you about eating breakfast. I actually sure. started last year on my bulk. My bulk was very, very similar. I did have some squats and some deadlifts, but honestly, like the weight was very light. Like I was kind of mad that I wasn't lifting any weight. Um, <laughs> but I put six inches on my 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 butt, my hips, um, and basically all I did was hip thrusts, barbell hip thrusts, banded hip thrusts, like body weight, single leg. Um, Romanian deadlifts, good mornings. Like I wasn't squatting and deadlifting heavy weight when I was, it was, there were some quarter reps in there followed by like super set it with like full reps. So you get like a quarter and then like a full, um, but it was just volume, light, light weight. Um, and a lot of carbs, but I had to go back to eating breakfast. I had to, there's no way that you can eat 600 grams of carbs. I challenge anyone. If you can do it, do a bulk on 600 grams of carbs a day or more. And not eat breakfast. 
Like, unless you drink four liters of Mountain Dew, like, there's really no way to do it. Yes. Yeah. But what did you discover? Because what I discovered, I put um, in the article about what I learned on my photo shoot, I look better eating breakfast. <laughs> I looked, my muscles looked fuller. Um, mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I felt like my mat, there was more mass. Um, I don't know what that means. That's just what it looked like. But what did you, what have you learned in going back to eating breakfast? It's tough because if you would have asked me this question about a year ago, I'd have all kinds of answers. But now since I've eaten breakfast for a solid year, because at the time I, I fasted for like four or five years, like yeah. and I never ate breakfast until at least 11 or 12 every single day. Um, I do know that one of the reasons I skipped breakfast was because I would eat breakfast and I would get hungry very quickly thereafter. So it was one of my ways to combat that hunger. And and that's a lens that I've always viewed my diets on. How do I minimize my hunger? Because there's two reasons people eat. Number one, they're hungry. Number two, they're bored. I mean, I guess you could start getting into like, you're stressed, you're anxious, you're emotional. You're, there, so there's a, we, a, a I, I, won't, I won't go there. I'm, I'm learning that myself as my wife yeah. goes through some things mm-hmm. right now. With her uh, there, okay, so let's just say the reasons you eat are either physiological or psychological. They're one right. of those two. There, there's no other category or, or, or their trap that they could, could fall into. So I knew that I couldn't eat because of psychological reasons because I worked. I, I was teaching at the time when, when I was fasting. Um, <laughs> so I decided that I just needed to minimize my hunger so that I I could get through to lunch and and there there you go i'd be able to fast and it would be a pretty easy endeavor and not eating breakfast made that simpler um looking back at things the real reason i was probably hungry is because when i woke up i had a granola bar and a banana and it was not like a protein granola bar or anything it was like your old school sugar bomb granola bars and a banana so in essence what i was really doing is eating 200 calories worth of straight carbohydrates with no protein and no fat mixed in so i probably woke up in the morning got an insulin spike and then i had a, a resulting blood sugar crash and i ended up feeling cranky and shitty that's probably what happened because it, where this is all leading to is the the biggest discovery is that if i eat an intelligent breakfast that contains some protein. I make sure that I get hydrated with water the first thing that I wake up. I make sure that I have some carbohydrates for some fuel. I make sure that at times, uh, depends, not every day, but maybe I get a little bit of fat tossed in there to even out the macronutrient ratio so that I have a mixed meal. If I eat an intelligent breakfast, I'm not hungry in the least until two or three o'clock in the afternoon. If I eat an intelligent breakfast, if you eat a haphazard breakfast, like I said, a bowl of frosted flakes, that's 100 percent sugar. Yeah. OK, you're going to be hungry at 930 or if you you slam a donut and a, a Mountain Dew on your way to work. Yeah, you're, you're going to be hungry because you're eating crap food. And that was kind of an eye opener to me that it probably wasn't. The fasting, it probably wasn't the timing. It probably wasn't the breakfast. It probably wasn't any of that minutia that way too many people get entrapped in. It was probably just the fact that I was making stupid dietary choices. That's what made the fasting work yeah. for me, so to speak. Um, I did notice that my workouts got better um, by eating breakfast. And I'm not sure if that's from a, and, and I was working out, I was, I'm not an early in the morning workout guy either. I was working out after school at like three thirty, four o'clock. So I thought that was an interesting observation and I'm sure it's just, I got fuel in my body and then at lunchtime I got more fuel in my body. And then after work, I went right to the gym and I just been, I've been properly fueled, properly hydrated and, and I felt more alive. My, my workouts definitely uh, improved. Uh, for sure. I find out, and this is a big one, and uh, this is anecdotal, ladies and gents. Uh, I started sleeping better. I found that to be interesting. I've, I've never really been a very good sleeper. I've always been a really light sleeper. I've been one of those, there's a million different thoughts flowing through my head as I lay my head down on the pillow to try to rest. And it only gets worse with age, with jobs and mortgages and kids and you know, fitness things uh, that I need to do. Um, so I've never really been a very good sleeper and eating breakfast. Um, I'm not sure if that calmed down my cortisol level. I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly what it did uh, physiologically. Maybe it was all uh, in my head and it just helped me to relax a little bit. Um, my was it caffeine, did you cut your caffeine intake down? I did. Were- I, I, I have at the time. Uh, oh gosh. When did I cut that down? Actually, yeah, I think it was right about that time too. So yeah, there's always confounding factors and variables. Yeah. Um, I used I used to be 
hard dude i'd put eight tablespoons of of real thick like dark roast into the coffee mm. machine like it was like it was probably 500 milligrams of caffeine in one cup of coffee it was just so ridiculous um also this is interesting too um i don't want to cause any shockwaves so again anecdotal but i always do my physical in april of every year so in April of 2015, I was still fasting, right? And in 2015, uh, my freestanding testosterone uh, was uh, 292. So this is pretty low. And I was like, oh, shit, do I need to get on TRT? What's going on? What do I need to do? Um, and then once I started with this more volume-based approach, once I started eating breakfast, again, a lot of factors. I can't say it's this lifting or it's this fasting. I can't. Too many factors. But it was all the way up to like 475 within a year. Um, so I don't know what part of, of what I've been doing. I, I promise you I'm as natty as natty comes other than protein shakes protein, and creatine, right? I, I use that powder, that creatine powder, <laughs> but that's uh, it. <laughs> I, I love when like I say something about that and people get that look on their face of like, is it a steroid? I'm like, you can buy it in Walmart. Like, yeah, guys, it, come on. No, the proper response is, do you ever eat a cheeseburger? Because there's creatine in there's a cheeseburger, creatine, okay? There's creatine in every every piece of meat you eat. Yeah, I mean, this is just this is dumb. So, yeah. so yeah, I'm totally natty. I'm not on TRT. I'm not on any sort of anabolic anything. Um, I I am about as likely as natural as it comes in in the fitness business world, possibly. Maybe you too, but <laughs> I I'm I'm as natural as they come. I do want to get my testosterone tested um i uh can't really do that right now because i don't have health insurance but um you know uh <laughs> don't I say do. that too loudly obama will get you <laughs> whatever i'm gonna have to pay my fine at the end of the year you know, it's uh, no i'm gonna say it right here it's cheaper for my wife and i to get a non-contested divorce 250 dollars than it is for her to put me on her health insurance or for me to get insurance through the marketplace because of her job cheaper yeah. for us to get divorced but we won't go into that we're talking about no squats no deadlifts Huge gains. Um, so let's talk about your gains. What did you put on the biceps? Because I've looked at it. It's a pretty big upper body split. It's not a – you have one lower body day, which is awesome because let's be – like I love legs. I love my ass, so I'm going to do – like your program would be like, don't do this. I'd be like, Jason, I got I to gotta, I gotta train his butt. Like I don't know if you've seen it, but it's pretty it's – pretty, it's, it's juicy. Um, but what were your gains? What did you see on your upper body doing this program? Sure. Um, I gave my biceps were around or they were about 15 and a half. And currently they are about 16 and a quarter, depending on, you know, how hydrated I am, what I ate the night before and sure. uh, how, how lean I am uh, and, and like that. I do know the last time that I was this lean. Uh, was a couple years ago, back when I was doing minimalist approaches, super strong, and never really tried a volume-based approach, right, uh, that I kind of discussed there. And the last time I was this lean, my arms were about 15 and 15 to 15 and 15.1 to 15.2, somewhere around there. So uh, since I changed those approaches and continuously lifted, I've put about an inch or so on, on my arms. I... I am really, unless I'm cutting and I'm paying a coach to cut and he says you need to take all of these body measurements, I'm not too big of a body measurement guy. What, I Jason, do, you wrote that article and then I stole all of your ideas for like those nine places that have people measured. What are you I know. And all my, how can and you, all my how, you, you and, blasphemy. And, and all of my dieting or all of my uh, fat loss clients, uh, I, I uh, require them to check in and take all sorts of really, really close data. Um, once you eventually automate things, as, as I'm sure you are aware, I know you're just being facetious here. Uh, you know, once <laughs> once you trust the process and you master your habits, I mean, you can just diet and, you know, like I'm dieting right now. I'm losing fat, you know. And you don't really need the tape measure to tell you that you're losing fat. You you know that yeah. that you're losing fat. Um, and uh, bulking, though, bulking doesn't come as naturally to me. So over these next uh, 14, 15 weeks, I'm going to closely be tracking my weight 
And uh, my goal is uh, y'all t- I'll, I'll weigh myself uh, each day of the week, divide it by seven. That I'll call that my weekly weight. And then my goal is to gain under one pound, between zero and one pounds each week on average. And um, that's such an inexact science with the way that our bodies work and metabolism oh, and God. all that stuff. Um, so, y- y- you know, it's tough to make those decisions in some sort of a completely objective way. But uh, um, I know that if you just compare pictures, and that's what I always like to do, is I like to look. I like to look in the mirror. Look in the mirror, look at the pictures, see what those things say. Um, last year, I took some fitness pictures, and I took some fitness pictures this year, and there's a world of difference between the two. Oh, yeah. There's so I, I, I know that. Um, so while, while I might not be able to tell you how many centimeters my chest grew over the last year, I know that I have bigger titties, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, I, I just, I, did, I wasn't sure if you were, uh, measuring as, as you do with your, your fat loss clients. Um, but I think when you're, when you're losing fat, the, that is an important number to see because the scale is so wonky and can do a million different things. Um, it is. Yeah, it is. Seen those well, and, and one of the biggest reasons that guys like us ask their clients to to track their progress is because you want to develop that positive feedback loop. Yeah. You want to show them, hey, I mean, I crushed these last 10 days. Oh, shit. Look at that huge drop. Or I didn't do so hot this weekend. I went to the lake and I ate all of the things. Oh, wow. I stayed kind of stagnant that week. And well, yes, that's what we can. When you do the positive habits, you will get the positive returns. When you don't, you you just want to establish that cause and effect relationship. And that's real. And well, we're not perfect and infallible. I know we like to think that we are, especially on the internet. Um, but sometimes we make mistakes and I'll tell people, you know, the one that go, are you sure of these macros? I say, I'm 99.9% sure. But then again, I've coached over a thousand people. So you might be that one. <laughs> so, so I've made mistakes before and I'll probably make mistakes again. I'm pretty sure of the numbers. I've worked with a large enough population that you can, you know, you can match people up and connect the dots for them. But I mean, we make mistakes. And so if you're taking the proper measurements and you're staying on point, an adjustment is purely mathematical. Yeah. So it makes it easy to do. So let's talk a little uh, before we wrap up. What's what's the leg day look like? Uh, I know you've basically, since you've done no squats, no deadlifting, uh, it's been a lot of leg presses, which, by the way, and you might know his name, maybe I'm forgetting, but there was a bodybuilder who never squatted and still had huge legs. Like, all he did was leg press. Um, yeah, uh, shoot. Was it? Dang it, I just mentioned him the other, the other day uh, in, in a Facebook argument between Yates? people. Yeah, Dorian Yates. Dorian I Yates. Thought, that's, that's, what I, that's what I thought, but I didn't want to be like, you know, that idiot who said Dorian Yates. And yeah, he uh, <laughs> he had a hip injury or something, and he had to stick with just the leg press, so I'm not sure how long he did it. And but, his legs were still huge. Oh, my God. His legs looked like oak trees with veins running down them. They were yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> they really were. So what does the leg um, day look like? Well, uh, I'll give you – I'll tell you what. I had a leg day today. So I'll tell you what my leg day looked like for today. Um, I started off with myo reps on the leg press. And the way I do that uh, is with a relatively low weight, uh, it was 200 pounds or something, which on a leg press is like nothing, nothing burger, right? Um, and so the way I do myo reps is uh, 20 repetitions, really slowly controlled, no locking out, keeping constant tension on the muscle. So after I hit all 20, uh, you rest five seconds. And then you go do another set of five, rest five seconds, do another set of five, rest five seconds, do another set of five. You go until you cannot get a set of five. Um, so that was what I started with. And I think I got to 40. I didn't get my, if I hit 50, um, total repetitions, then I throw an extra 10 pounds on it or whatever for the next time. I didn't get to 50. I got to 40. Um, and then I, uh, went over to barbell hip thrusts. And I did three sets of barbell hip thrusts, rest, pause style. So rest, pause style uh, is uh, I aimed for seven to eight reps on set one. And then I set it down, rested for 10 seconds, and then I did an AMRAP, as many reps as possible after that. And usually you get between two and four. And I think for the first couple, I got five. And then on the last one, I got four. So I did uh, that was barbell hip thrusts uh, at 285. 
And then I did the lying leg curls, which I freaking love. Like for a tall guy like me to be able to just isolate those muscles. I know machines and isolations are the devil and functional movements and cavemen and stuff like that. Um, I love that freaking machine. I lay down on it on my stomach and I can go nice and slow with a full range of motion, just destroy those hamstrings. So I did three sets of 15 with, it was like 115 pounds. So again, not... Uh, the heavy lifting days for me are likely over. And then I did uh, a century set of a couple different movements. And the way I do century sets is I aim for a weight that I can do between 40 and 50 repetitions on the first set. And then after my first set is done, I rest for 30 seconds and then I start again. And then after I, I go to failure, rest for 30 seconds, start again. That's how I do century sets until you get to 100 repetitions. So I did the low row machine century set. I did the cable chest flies a, a century set. And I did seated uh, calf raises century set. As you can see there, I toss, a, toss in a little upper body on my leg days. I got to bro it out a little bit. Um, and then I did some curls and some triceps. Took me about 80 minutes because um, I don't really rest a lot. I rest until I catch my breath and then I go again because my point is no longer pure 100% strength gains. My point is keeping tension on the muscle, causing metabolic stress and doing muscular damage. So as long as my, my I got my breath, I don't care if my muscles are ready. I'm going to roll again. So that was a Jason Helmus leg day to den to leg day to day and uh, in about three or four hours here here i will really start to feel it i promise <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say but that is one hell of a pump uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i can only so what do you so century sets is this included in no deadlift no squats no deadlifts huge gains or is this just something for two no for this is actually something i got I, I picked up a few of these little techniques i recently trained with uh, scott tusignant um, the owner of Metabolic Masterpiece, uh, who lives in uh, Canada. He lives in Ontario. And I went and trained with him, and he was showing me a few techniques. Um, we didn't do any century sets on that day, but he was uh, talking about them a little bit with me. I said, oh, that sounds really interesting. He says, get ready, dude. Get ready for the burn. And yeah. that's, that's causing that metabolic stress that I was talking about. Yeah. Um, those are done, all of them. Uh, and like I did cable flies today. I think I used 10 pounds. And but they're just done really slowly, as much of a stretch as you can, never releasing the tension, methodical, uh, making sure that you're recruiting maximal muscle fibers. I was really trying to make sure that I squeezed my pecs together in order to activate all of those muscles. Um, the first set is pretty brutal, and then the rest of the sets get progressively worse until you want to die on the last set. <laughs> so and and like you're done you're like oh my god it's 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 different it's totally different than anything i've ever tried uh the five years ago me would have said this is bro science and bro workouts and you just need to get stronger and that's you know what i would have called it? i would have called it fuck around itis is what i would have called it but uh it's producing some pretty awesome results and if it gets results that's not fuck around itis in my mind i i agree um so as you as you get older uh, as you age, you said you're, you're pretty much done with the heavy, heavy lifting. Uh, is this basically your training style for, for the next little, next little while? And when you go back to strength training, cause you said you might have to, is it going to be, do you, I mean, are you going to be deadlifting 500 pounds or are you just going to focus on like, instead of 10 to 12 and 15 and hundred, you know, reps, are you looking for eight? like eight to 10. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I, I do understand that's, that's something too. Here I am going, Oh, you don't need to push the heavy limits. And people are going, well, why don't you just squat with higher numbers? Why don't you just deadlift with higher numbers? And I've tried those approaches, probably not for a prolonged concerted effort for, you know, multiple weeks, uh, at least, um, you know what I would probably want to do? Because there's this theory that the bigger a muscle it is, the more force that it can produce, and therefore the stronger it can be. So bodybuilders would benefit their overall – I'm sorry, power lifters would benefit their overall totals if they spent specific time doing hypertrophy work. And then at the same time, there's the flip side of that that says that bodybuilders can only build so much muscle if they can catch the pump so they need to do right so right. it kind of works both ways so i could really see myself testing that well i know my muscles are bigger okay let's give it three months and let's chase strength exclusively 
let's ride a linear progression or a very simple percentage-based periodization model, and let's see if we can beat our previous numbers after three or four weeks of practice. I could totally see myself doing that, um, and it would probably be for a short stint. I do actually just just prefer the energy that it gives me, the the pep, and really, you know what? I kind of I kind of love training. Um, yeah. it, it's kind of my my zen. I I just get to zone out there's no power puff girls princess castles there's no bills to, <laughs> there's no bills to pay when you're in the gym there's no snot head 12 year old uh shooting spitballs at the pretty girl behind him in class there's none of that nonsense when you're in the gym so i just i like that that's my meditative time and spending five days per week there is better than spending three days per week there if you're looking to gain muscle and get size that is that is true uh considering last year was 90 minutes of six days a week for me. I, I, I remember the, uh, the, the actually I loved it. I, I almost want to go back and do it again. Uh, but I promised the wife no bulking this winter. Um, <laughs> she's, she's like, I'm really tired of you. Like cutting, bulking, cutting, bulking, cutting, bulking. Why don't you just do? And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'm down with that. It gives me more time to focus on the business. Um, hey, go to, go go to one of those lean gains approaches, right? Not the lean gains actual, but, but like the I'm going to maintain kick ass in the gym and see if I can make small gains over time. Yeah, gain gain taining some gain taining. Yep. yep. Um, so real quick, I want to talk about the nutrition side of this. Is this so you're in you're working you know upper body three times a day, three times a week, you know lower body once, uh, you know, and then a fifth day, um, again probably upper body. Um, What's the nutrition look like on this? Are we talking high carb? Is this like one of those 600 grams of carbs sort of things? Or where are you sort of helping people place this? Right. Um, well, it, it, I didn't get really into nutrition. I, I gave some pretty basic guidelines. Um, my guess is if you're here, you're at this spot, you've, you, you've done some macronutrient-based dieting before, and you kind of know how all this thing works. Um, so uh, my – suggestions are to make sure you are at least maintaining, if not maintaining, gaining. If you're gaining, you want to be aiming for around a pound per week or less, but make sure the scale is going up over time. I do tell uh, in the book to make sure to be careful of your fats because if you are over your calorie maintenance, your fats can easily be converted into fat, especially if you end up with too much of a surplus. Right. Um, and I definitely do say in the book, your main variable is going to be your carbohydrate. Keep your fats moderate to even on the low side if you want to go there, if you have that sort of wiggle room and you can handle a high-carbohydrate, low-fat diet. Um, but uh, frankly, as I know that we've discussed your bulking uh, 600 grams of carbs constantly, I'll tell you what, uh, for everybody listening, if you consume 600 grams of carbs and you also consume 100 grams of fats, you're going to gain fat fast. Yeah. Um, so you, you got to be careful with that. Yeah. Um, those sorts of crazy diets, I've seen a number of people doing them. I've seen you doing them and Vacanti doing them. And, and I'm sure like Romanello is, I'm sure a lot of people have done them. Um, they can only work if you keep your dietary fat really in check. Yeah. I had to um, keep mine. I had to keep mine at like 50. And even then it was a little higher than what I wanted. But to, to be honest, I mean, the, at that point you were literally eating three cups of white rice a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. only so much white rice you can eat with like doused in hot sauce. Shoot, a, a cup uh, of white rice is only 70 grams of carbs. So three cups of white rice, you're only sitting at 210 grams of carbs on three cups of white rice, and that is just a shit ton of volume to get into your stomach. That's yep. so much rice. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but to, nice to, to directly answer your question, I do have parameters like that. Um, it's primarily a, a building program and a workout, so I keep it as simple and as basic as possible i do give a little here's how you would set your macros if you've never done that sort of a thing template in the book so nutrition is included there as well yes awesome well jason uh we're gonna wrap up here what is what's the one thing you really want people to get out of this program who maybe uh have done squats and deadlifts in the past maybe they they are more achy when they do them but they think they need to do it what's one thing you really want everyone to take away from no squats no deadlifts huge gains Awesome. Um, and, and I know what that is. Um, because 
I've talked to a number of people and, you know, trying to get affiliates and, and other people on board and, and, and other, I put an advertisement out on Facebook and man, I just got lambasted and I'm sure that you saw it. I got crushed. It's still up on Facebook. I don't even want to go click on my messages, but uh, I mean, just called every name under the sun and, you know, the internet warriors were out in full effect and the trolls were out in full effect and, and whatever, they don't really know me. So I guess, you know, people hide behind their computers and their anon- anonymity, the, the fact that they are completely anonymous and and they don't really care all too much that's kind of the way the world is sometimes um and there are just people out there that are going to love to squat and deadlift and fantastic i'm not saying that approach isn't good that approach might be optimal i don't know who determines what's good and what's optimal have we ever studied those two approaches in some sort of a controlled environment and figured out which one does actually give you the biggest gains no we have anecdotal evidence and we have the evidence that various coaches have you know come across over however long their careers or their expertise has been but there's this stigma when, for whatever reason, you don't want to squat and deadlift or you can't squat and deadlift. Right. And that is really getting under my skin. I wrote an article a couple of years ago called Most People, and it was about this big echo chamber and this bubble that fitness people and people that are really into working out, this bubble that they live in. And inside this echo chamber, everything is so important. Leg day is important. Squatting and deadlifting are important. Your meal time and your post-workout anabolic window is important. Your supplementation, nutrient partitioning. These all these are all things that we have deemed important in this fishbowl of fitness jerk-offs. Maybe that's a little strong. But yeah, you're fine. So we have deemed that this stuff is important. And you know who cares about that shit in the real world? Nobody. And I've mentioned that a few times. Nobody cared about my squat totals. Nobody really cared if I leaned out. Nobody cared if I had a six-pack. Nobody cared if I didn't. People don't care about this. Most people don't care about this. And and that's where my lens is coming from, and that's where my frame is coming from. And as a teacher, I am in the real world. I'm not in the, the gym world, the bodybuilding world, the going for shows world, the power lift. That's not my world. My world is the actual real world where, you know, it's out there. So where am I going with all of this? Um, I've run across a number of people because, I mean, my name is Eddie Man Fitness and it's right there and I try to simplify things. I'm not an innovator. I'm a simplifier. And I try to simplify things for people to make things accessible, to make things less scary and less intimidating. Because you know how many people over the last three years said, oh, Jason, please, can I not squat? Can I do something else? Uh, and oh, I can't deadlift for this and the other. I don't want to deadlift. So, so those are the people that are brave enough to come to me, hire a fitness coach that they know I like these things. They know that I'm big fans of these things, and they're still brave enough to come to me and tell me, hey, Jason, I don't like doing these. Can you please change these? I do try to talk them out of changing them. We need to face our fears, all that stuff that I had talked to you about earlier. But it just makes me think how many people are out there in the real world whose lives would just become so enhanced if they took up strength training and resistance training. But when they look at strength training and resistance training, they see that you must squat and deadlift because that's all anybody says. And they go say, no, screw that. That's too scary. No, I'm not going to do that. Or uh, I had a buddy uh, who I've known for a very long time and recently had hip surgery and knee surgery. And someone made a very condescending comment uh, on my Facebook comment or Facebook post about how people that don't squat and deadlifts are big uh, wusses. And he responded with, you know, some people just have different approaches. And she responded with something like, or you're just a little bitch or something like that. Like, just like, and I'm like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This guy, she didn't even know it. He had had hip replacement surgery a year ago. He had had back surgery twice in his life. Now, might squatting and deadlifting perfectly with a trainer in this, I mean, might that help him? Yeah, sure, of course. That might help him. Maybe that's what he should do. But now he's sitting there feeling like shit Mm -hmm. because some elite asshole 
told him that the only way you're going to make fitness work is to quit being a little bitch and squat and deadlift. And that's just not true. So I just, that's kind of the lens where I'm coming from. Um, again, don't pick the product up if you think it's an easy way out. It's not. It's not a, you've seen it yourself. You're not going to go into that and breeze through it and gain muscle. Muscle building is 10 times harder than fat loss. Fat loss is literally you work out and and you eat in these amounts, boom, you lose fat. Now, obviously, it's a lot harder psychologically, but muscle gain is a physically more difficult endeavor to actually succeed in. (laughs) Yes, Uh, Like (laughs) 10 times more difficult um, for sure. Um, So don't think it's a cookie cutter breeze through it. Um, But if you're interested for a different approach and you want to try something new out, then, hey, that's what we're here for. Yeah, there you go. Or if you've had problems, I, I had some people reach out to me and were like, man, I can't squat, I can't deadlift, what can I do? You know, you get, and he's, you wanted to know what he could do to build a bigger butt. There's a ton of things you can still do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's not all end all be all the squats and, and deadlifts. Um, I mm-hmm. do love them myself, um, but that's just, that's me. And you can get on the leg press and be a Dorian Yates. You can do hip thrusts in many different ways and, and grow your glutes. Um, there's a thousand ways to, to skin a cat, but, uh, mm-hmm. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. I'm stoked for the product guys. Uh, I will have a show notes over at cyquestfitness.com forward slash Jason, J A S O N hyphen Helmus H E L M E S. And there'll be a number three beside of that. Cause this is the third time he's been on the show. That's right. I'm the OG for y'all that don't know the OG that I am podcast guest numero uno well three but you know we'll, we'll uh we'll, we'll what, no wasn't i i wasn't i your very first pod- no. podcast no. oh i wasn't oh son of a gun sorry i made myself <laughs> feel stupid <laughs> no it was uh, it was chuck gross oh um, my mistake uh, but uh yeah i will have it over there cyquestfitness.com forward slash jason helmus three and you can get your link to no squats no deadlifts huge gains and Put some volume on your upper body uh, this this fall on your bulk. Maintain a, a nice, strong lower body. Um, Jason, you can see it. He looks fantastic uh, in the photos, uh, but I'll have those links over there for you guys as well. So, Jason, thank you again for coming on the show, and let's get you back on again before, like, a year. Like not, I mean, I like the anniversary edition of, of Helmus returning, but, uh, you know, we should we should get you back on again sometime soon. I think that's absolutely fantastic, dude. It's always a pleasure. I love coming on here and talking to you. I appreciate the opportunity. Step up and you gotta get it fitness. Host Rob at the moment and the quest is you gotta check it and wreck it. You're breaking personal records and with the help of the guests you won't be guessing on the lessons. That's a plus five fears. Got a low key bamf right here. You wanna meet them? There's no better way to greet them than to strike a boss pose. Take a look into the mirror.